to the hearts of people, the idea of being <clears throat> captured and then sold abroad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some kind of snippets of Irish poetry testifying to the fear that people had. Lord, protect us from these foreigners coming in and taking people away. There's an early 11th century tale about an Irish poet who's said to have been taken captive by Vikings, and, and even as a man, he'd been gang raped by the Vikings on the ship. There's also a record in 940 of an Irish bishop taken captive on Dalkey Island, and he's so eager to escape, he tries to swim out from the island and he drowns. The Vikings offer us the earliest example of those figures who will dominate the written and spoken stories of Ireland, the foreign invaders. But where did the raiders come from? And what drove them to Irish shores? Vikings who would eventually descend on Ireland had their ancestral roots here in Norway. From these fjords, they created a maritime empire that stretched from the shores of America in the west to central Russia in the east. The Viking world of the 7th and 8th centuries was in a state of flux. Warrior clans fought for control of the best land. Land meant wealth and power, but there was too little to go around. In an early Norse poem, a mother says to her son, get thee a ship and go out on the seas and kill men. They're lines which reflect a society where a man's worth was defined by his skill with the sword. What kind of a society did these Viking warlords inhabit? Competition was actually a key element in this society who could travel the furthest, who was the bravest in battle, who could eat the most, and who could drink the most. What is the principal dynamic that's driving them out of these fjords towards Ireland? It was important for the local chieftains to be able to give good gifts to the followers, the friends, or throw big parties. And there was not enough wealth in Norway. So I think that one of the main reasons that they actually left for Ireland was just to plunder some Irish monasteries and churches and steal the goods. The Irish in popular memory tend to see the Vikings as rapists, pillagers and killers. Is that something you'd go along with? Partly, yes, but you have to look at the, the Vikings so they can actually change shapes over the night. One day they are actually killers, the next day they are actually traders. And then the third day, they are craftsmen, and the fourth day, they are settlers. For over 40 years, the Vikings raided Ireland's coastal villages and monasteries, carrying off plunder and slaves in their longboats. They struck suddenly and caught the Irish unawares. So the Vikings became bolder and began to sail down the rivers of Ireland. The raiders were to become settlers. The east coast of Ireland was strategically well placed for trading with an expanding Viking world. In the winter of 842, a substantial Viking fleet rounded the headland at Hoth and sailed up the River Liffey. Here at the Black Pool in Irish Dovlin, the Vikings hauled their longboats ashore. And just a few yards away from the banks of the River Liffey, they began to construct the first defensive stockade. From these small beginnings, Ireland's greatest city would emerge. Over the next century, Dublin would become a boom town with the largest slave market in Europe.
the Vikings had a huge trading network which spread all the way down the Russian river systems to the Middle East, Constantinople, all the way across the North Atlantic. And Dublin was quite centrally placed within these long distance routes. What kind of things would people have been buying in these markets? Amber from the Baltic, silk from Byzantium, gold, silver, looted goods from Irish monasteries, all would have been traded through the port of Dublin. It would have been a very noisy place, bustling, crammed houses next to each other, narrow streets, lots of people milling around, shopping, exchanging things, gossiping, kids, pigs, everything. And you'd probably have seen people from right across Europe in Dublin at this point. It would have been a really cosmopolitan place with traders from all across Europe. And this is followed by a series of royal intermarriages and a lot of cultural interchange. So by the 10th century, you've got a whole new culture emerging, which is a kind of hybrid of Scandinavian and Irish and it's very distinctive you can see it in art styles and the culture of these two peoples. By the 11th century the Vikings who'd settled in Ireland, the Hiberno-Norse, had been here for over a century and a half. They'd intermarried, become Christian, and formed local alliances. They'd founded thriving port cities like Waterford, Wexford, Cork, and Limerick. They became enmeshed in Irish politics. They would learn the lesson of all conquerors here. The longer you stay around, the more likely you are to become drawn into the quarrels of your neighbors. This was a country where local Gaelic kings were fighting for land and supremacy. They did so as power was being centralized across Europe. Small kingdoms were eaten up by the leaders of emerging dynasties. In northern France, Rollo the Viking had founded the Norman Empire. In England, power was consolidating around the House of Wessex. Such change could hardly have escaped the attention of an ambitious Irish king. This new leader was a man with the ruthlessness and energy to humble kingdoms. He stormed the strongholds of his enemies and in four years was able to come here to the great rock of Cashel and proclaim himself king of all Munster. He demanded tributes from the defeated of wine and gold and the most precious commodity of the age, cattle. They called him Brian of the Cattle Tributes. In the Irish, Brian Boru. Brian did not see himself as a king among equals, but as high king of all Ireland. And with a mighty army, he set about trying to control the island. In the only statement of his that we know about, he describes himself as Imperator Scotorum, Emperor of the Irish. Imperator means a man who rules over many different peoples and he saw himself as ruling equally over the Irish and the Vikings. He subjected Limerick to himself and made Limerick a dynastic capital. He subjected Cork and Waterford to himself. Dublin was next on the list. In Dublin City Hall, the legend of Brian is commemorated on the dome. In the telling of Ireland's story, he would become an icon of native resistance, the first nationalist hero. His soldiers, holy warriors who defeated a Viking invasion. But the truth is more complex. In 1014, after defeating the city of Waterford, Brian moved to confront the Gaelic kingdom of Leinster and the Viking port of Dublin. Irish and Viking united in defence against Brian. They recruited Viking mercenaries from Britain. 
It's thought Brian too had Vikings in his army. For both sides, Dublin was the glittering prize. The Battle of Clontarf is not a battle between savage Vikings and the Irish. It's not the saving of Holy Ireland from the pagans. It is a power struggle in which Brian Boru was finally going to get Dublin because every king wanted to control the trading cities. On Good Friday, 1014, the opposing forces faced each other at Clontarf outside Dublin. There were two Irish armies, but both with their Viking allies. Of these Vikings, it was said, they carried arrows, anointed and browned in the blood of dragons. The monks who wrote this account were highly partisan. After all, they'd been commissioned by a descendant of Brian Boru. Of his men, they said, they had beautiful white hands hands that they would now use to hack, hew and maim. The battle lasted all day. Late in the afternoon, the Dublin men and their allies began to fall back to the River Liffey and into the advancing tide. An account written years later records that they retreated to the sea like a herd of cows tormented by heat and insects. They were pursued closely. By nightfall, bodies drifted on Dublin Bay and the field at Clontarf was strewn with corpses. Brian had won the battle, but he wouldn't live to enjoy the fruits of victory. A Danish Viking called Brodar came hacking his way through the Irish lines and found Brian's tent. Entering inside, he saw the old king on his knees at prayer and lifting his giant battle axe, he cleaved Brian's head from his shoulders. In this version of the story, Brian becomes the first martyr for faith and fatherland in Irish history. Without Brian, his dynasty declined. There would be no all-powerful High King of Ireland. Clontarf resolved nothing. Indeed, so great was the fighting after Brian's death that one analyst described how competing kings had turned the country into a trembling sod. Ireland was now a ripe prize for foreign adventurers, and they would come here in the shape of the greatest military force in Europe to launch on these shores a fateful conquest. Thank you.